Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Jerry Bone. I'm a farmer and cattle producer from South Central Kansas. I'm also privileged to serve as the president-elect of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. I'm pleased to welcome you tonight to the webinar focused on health issues in mid to late fed cattle. We are proud to be working with several industry leaders to bring you the latest on this topic. As a participant, your line will be muted, but feel free to type in questions in the question box on your screen during the webinar, and at the end of the presentation, we will get to as many of those as time will allow. If you have trouble with your technology, or if you're joining us only for the audio, the webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing in a few days at ncba.org. Just look for the producer tab on the website. Now I would like to thank our sponsor for this webinar, the National Corn Growers Association. And welcome to Michael Granach, the manager of market development with the National Corn Growers Association for some welcoming comments. Michael, uh, welcome. Thank you, Jared. Good evening, everyone. My name is uh, Michael Granche. I'm the manager of market development for the National Corn Growers Association. Um, on behalf of National Corn Growers Association, I just want to thank you guys um, for having having us here tonight and uh, letting us be a part of this webinar. Um, at NCGA, we're always happy to partner with NCBA for events like this, um, events to help circulate information to folks in the industry. Cattle is a critical customer for corn, and we are so appreciative of this partnership, and uh, we're, we're excited for all the good work ahead of us. The webinar tonight will feature Dr. Myra Johnson of the National Cattlemen's Beef Association, Dr. Dan Thompson of Iowa State University, and Dr. Milt Thomas of Colorado State University. Dr. Thomas, the floor is yours. Mel, I think you're still muted, if you could unmute for us. Dr. Thomas, uh, your audio is still muted, if you're able to unmute so we could hear you. Unmuted, finally. Sorry about that. Sometimes the way you click on these computers is quite challenging. And you would think after sitting at home and doing nothing for about the last 40 days, I'd had that mastered. Well, good evening, everyone. And it's sure an honor to be on this call today. Um, my talk today represents quite a large team of people that's been working on um, some of these acronyms that we have over on this side of the screen. Um, I represent the breeding and genetics team at Colorado State, and we spend a lot of time working on generation of EPD. And today we're going to talk about an EPD known as PAP or pulmonary arterial pressure. But why do we work on that, or why is that acronym such an important thing? Well, an animal that has high PAP is really suffering from what we know as pulmonary hypertension. That means blood pressure within the pulmonary artery is extremely high. And that's causing really bad things to happen within the heart and lungs. And so in mountainous country, um, if we have cattle suffering from that kind of syndrome, a lot of times we talk about it as high altitude disease or HAD. But in, in feedlots on the Great Plains, if we observe that phenotype, then we're talking about things that we call FHD, feedlot heart disease. And so hopefully by the end of my talk, all these acronyms and alphabet soup will make makes sense to everybody. Um, this is a really interesting picture over here. We got kind of a normal steer and then we have an animal here with a swollen brisket. And um, folks that ranch in mountain country know a lot about that. And you know that's that's a syndrome brisket disease has been documented and talked about for a century. But recently we've been talking about that in fed cattle. And so hopefully after my slides today we'll have a better understanding of what that is. 
I wish I had a solution for it. We don't at this time, but there's big teams of geneticists working on that, and then there's other people working on um, feline heart disease from a management standpoint. Okay, so a little bit of a little bit of background information. Um, I started out talking about high elevation beef production systems and ranches, and the browner the color on this map, usually the higher the elevation, and so. Brisket disease and those kinds of things have always been thought about as things that only happen in the mountains. But the thing that we need to realize is that, you know, we do raise cattle in the mountains, but we have what we call the Great Plains. And if you start somewhere down around Lubbock, Texas, and you follow the Front Range all the way up to somewhere like Cheyenne, Wyoming, there's a pretty good high elevation plain that is kind of a big component of the beef industry. And so lots of feedlots on those high plains. And so even though we might think of that as, somebody like me from Colorado might say that's low altitude, but it's really moderate altitude. A lot of fed cattle that are in the range of somewhere from three to 5,000 feet of elevation um, fed on that, fed on that, um, in those ag systems. So really when we start talking about animals that get brisket disease and those kinds of things, we're talking about animals that are deficient in, in, in oxygen. And so a good scientific word for that is hypoxia. And so this is just a general slide of what might cause hypoxia. And of course, altitude is one of those things. Endurance sports, you know, extreme exercise, well, that could darn sure put an animal in a hypoxic state. So if you'd run 10 days straight in the Iditarod, there's probably some dogs in that that probably have, you know, a hypoxic condition. Anything that would cause a severe lung or heart disease could put an animal or a person into in a hypoxic condition or anything that would affect the red blood cells ability to transmit oxygen, you know, anemia and things like that. Anything that would, any kind of toxicant that would restrict blood flow, like a fescue toxicosis or something like that, that could possibly do it. But anything, any kind of other toxicant that's making tissue metabolism to be more anaerobic without oxygen rather than aerobic, and of course, obesity, and that's well documented in the human literature. And, you know, as we talk about fed cattle, we are, we're trying to finish these cattle. We're pushing them up to a very high level of body fatness to capture marbling and so forth, and they're in an obese state. And so all of these things in general can cause hypoxia. Uh, in 2018, Certified Angus Beef asked our team at CSU if we'd write a white paper, kind of, you know, explaining what do we mean by this verbiage of feedlot heart disease, FHD versus high altitude disease. And so if you go to the CAB website, there, this, this article is on there and um, I'm giving a lot of updated information relative to that article, but it's just a great uh, piece of literature if you'd like to learn more about this subject. So when we start talking about brisket disease and, and those kinds of syndromes, pulmonary hypertension, we got a lot of knowledge around things that happen in yearling cattle because in the western United States we do this pap testing. It's probably about 10,000 replacement bulls and heifers every year that are pap tested. A lot of people now do some of those animals at weaning to get that measurement earlier. So there's quite a bit of data and knowledge over you know the past century about these two time points. Lately though we've been talking about fed cattle so we're talking about things up here at the top of the growth curve. And I'm going to show you some data today so we understand that better. There's also a lot of folks in the mountainous areas that have studied, you know, baby calves and the effect of that. And we actually have some hypobaric chambers on the CSU campus that we can put baby calves in and simulate high altitude. And so there's quite a bit of knowledge there. But a lot of what we're talking about today is this problem in fed cattle. And of these boxes on my growth curve, unfortunately, that's kind of a a gap in knowledge. And so we're working hard to increase our knowledge of cattle at that area. So let's talk about pulmonary arterial pressure just for a minute and, and talk about the consequences of that, whether it's high or low. So how do we measure that? Well, we put an animal in the chute and a veterinary team comes out and they run a catheter through the jugular vein, down through the right atrium, the right ventricle up into the pulmonary artery and they measure that pressure. And when that catheter is in there, we have an oscilloscope and it's measuring the, 
the systolic and diastolic waves going through that. And um, so the trait that we use the most is usually mean PEP, or a, it's not quite an average, it's a calculation, but it's close to an average between the, the systolic and diastolic pressures within the heart. And so if we get an animal that has high pulmonary artery or a high PAP, you know, a lot of bad things can happen from that. Um, and here are two examples of animals that had high PAP. Here's an animal that actually perished from that, and this is looking at a necropsy. And because the animal had high PAP and the right side of the heart was trying to pump against the pressure within this pulmonary artery to push blood down into the lung, it malformed. And so the, the right side of the heart started to malform. And so the heart starts to look much more like a volleyball than a nice apical heart. And so, yeah, we had an animal that perished from that. But here's a picture of a bull, an Angus bull that's actually the son of one of the most famous Angus bulls that ever lived in, in the United States, QAS Traveler 23-4. And he, he had high pep and he lived with it. He tolerated it his entire life. Um, this bull lived to be at least eight years old, and uh, we collected semen from this bull, and they're using him in some studies. And, and um, so we get a wide variation in response from high pap, but in general, everything that happens from high pap is not good after that. So let's talk about pap scores and what they mean. Um, pap usually runs in the range of you know, 40 to 50 millimeters of mercury. And um, animals on this bell curve that are kind of over here on this left side, we'd say those are animals that their paps are like 41 millimeters or less, and they're ro low risk of anything bad happening in their life after that. Then we've got some animals that are in this range of 42 to 49, right over here. And they're at moderate risk of developing anything Sub, sub, subsequent to having high PAP. But then we have animals that have high PAP, 50 and above. And, and this is a very typical bell curve when we start looking at population data, that we get this wild, really extreme high levels of PAP. And those animals are at high risk of all kinds of cardiopulmonary anomalies that develop from having high PAP. But in general, when we, when we sample cattle in the mountains, trying to determine if they're tolerant and should be a replacement to a beef system. About 50% of those animals will, will, will have a low PAP, 40% moderate, and about 10% fall into this, this category of really high PAP and are high risk of cardiopulmonary issues. So let's just take a little bit of review and talk about animals that, suffer, that have, what kind of PAP we expect in all kinds of different animals and so forth. So over here, I've got, PAP as a measure, and remember we said 50 and above is kind of that high risk. And then what about animals that are low PAP? So right in this kind of area right here, I've got a picture of, of animals that have been papped, even though they might've been papped at really high altitude, have low PAP. So here's a yak that was papped at, you know, like 14,000 feet of elevation, you know, extremely high, but they have very low PAP. That's the most one of the most altitude tolerant animals. Here's a special cow a bovine, it's called a Himalayan cow, and they also have low PAP, very tolerant of high altitude. Um, this wasn't actually done, but people that are papped at basically sea level have very low levels. So even though I'm kind of suffering right now from not being able to watch Major League Baseball, most people that sea level have a PAP around 25. So I put last year in the World Series, the Nationals played the Astros. You know, both of those places are very close to sea level, so they have very low PAP. American bison, you know, whether they're out on the high plains or in a mountainous area, have very low PAP. Angus cat, Angus cross cows at sea level have a PAP around 34, okay? Very low. However, if you look at this, right, people that are suffering from cardiopulmonary disease issues have PAP that starts to really go up. You know, we're looking at, high 30s up to the mid 40s and with you know the standard air bar way up here okay but when we look at cattle particularly angus cattle that are growing or angus influenced cattle that are growing in a pretty high level notice that their paps are way up here their paps look a lot more like um people that are suffering from cardiopulmonary issues and here's some paps average paps 
from feed from fed cattle in the feedlot, getting ready to go to slaughter. You know, they got PAP averaging around 54. So an average feedlot steer today has a PAP that's higher than most people that would be suffering from cardiopulmonary issues. And so I'm not saying that's good, bad, or otherwise, but that is where our modern cattle exists when we start talking about pulmonary hypertension. Okay, they just have high pulmonary hypertension. So therefore, it shouldn't really be much of a surprise to anybody that we have or observe cattle that die once in a while in a feedlot that have extremely high PAPs and have cardiopulmonary issues because of that. So here's some pictures of some heart. This is something else. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this today. We've been developing a heart scoring system so we can collect massive amounts of data from packing plants and use that data you know, for genetic improvement in some kind and those types of things. But we've developed a heart scoring system. And so heart score of one, this is an animal that had PAPs of like 40, 36, 39 in that low risk category throughout its life as a, as a both a, an animal at an Angus stalker operation and then um, in, in the feedlot, okay? Very apical looking, very healthy looking heart. And then as, as here's an animal that, that perished, this was not taken in feedlot, this was, this was not taken in a packing plant, this was an animal that died before it ever got to the packing plant a very malformed heart, okay? Complete right side of the heart malformed and then the intermediate scores up to that. You know, and this animal here, um, you know, had a pap way into the 50s, you know, maybe by the time that animal slaughtered that, that heart score was up there close to 100 millimeters of mercury as far as its pap. And so it was very suffering from a cardiopulmonary issue. So as a geneticist, uh, we always like to know about the heritability of things, and so we calculate heritability. And to give it just a real quick definition of heritability, heritability is the portion of phenotypic variance that was actually due to genetics. So if we're looking at PAP as an indicator trait for cardiopulmonary remodeling and tolerance of hypoxia and those kinds of things, generally we've done many studies, you know, dating all the way back to 1992, PAP testing and so forth. Here's our most recent study we published in 2020. This had about 9,000 um, Angus animals that were PAP tested at altitudes of 6,000, 8,000 feet. The heritability is moderate. So 25% of the variation in the phenotype of PAP was due to genetics, but 75% was due to something else, you know, management issues, um, prior health issues, and things like that. But in general, I know there's a lot of data on that slide, but we would say PAP is a, a moderately heritable trait. And uh, recently, we've been doing a lot of high density genotyping. This is a slide that represents about 3,000 animals. Um, and we've published several of these. This is a recent, from our recent EPD genomic enhanced effort. And uh, Dr. Scott Spidell did that for our, uh, as we prepared for our keep and call last fall in 2019 based on uh, breeding values. And then we have another paper we published in in 2019 by Rebecca Cockrum um, that shows this kind of thing. So what does this, what does this tell us? So on this axis right here, one through 29 is the 29 autosomal chromosomes in, in cattle. And the 30th is the XY. And then on this axis is some level of statistic, okay? And so what you should see from this is, is that even though there's a high spot right here on this graph, there are many spots across the 29 chromosomes and the XY chromosome in cattle that influence the trait of PAP. So it's not a, it's not a simple gene thing like, like polled or horned or black or red. It's polygenic, like most of our growth traits or milk production and those kinds of things. Okay, so there's lots of loci influencing whether an animal tolerates PAP. And the other thing is that I wanted to circle is, is that the statistic on this is not very high. This was a Bayesian analysis. And if that number right there had been 0.9, we would say, wow, you know, that genetics has a lot to do with this trait. But I already told you that this trait was only moderately heritable, around 0.25. And this statistic here is only 0.3. So even though it's real high on the graph, there's, there's not, that marker doesn't account for a lot of variation. 
This marker is being talked about. There's a group of U.S. Mark working with this in fed cattle. These were all yearling bulls and heifers and steers that were involved in this. Um, but in our initial studies, that that single marker right there doesn't account for a lot of variation, which is common in most polygenic traits. Okay, so let's get back to talking about where we're at on the growth curve and um, what it might mean, particularly as we talk about fed cattle, um, because that's the focus of our conversation tonight. So I'm leading a team, we have a USDA grant, we got that funded in 2018, to really kind of further study um, pulmonary hypertension and what impacts it has on, um, on um, you know, fed cattle and those kinds of issues. And um, wow, the last, since January 1, and then because of the COVID scare, we haven't gotten much done the last few months. But hopefully we'll get back to work here soon and be able to work on this a lot. So I'm gonna show you some preliminary data from this study. So we worked with a, a beef producer from Eastern Colorado that knew um, that they have this issue. And we feed about 500 of their steers a year at the Eastern Colorado Research Center, which is at Akron, Colorado, and at an elevation at about 4,100 feet. And so we went out to design a study to where we could identify low PAP animals and high PAP animals. And then we were gonna viral challenge those animals with the hypothesis that, that you know, some of these late feeding insults, whether that be virus, whatever, um, is what causes some of those animals to perish. And um, I will tell you that um, as I go through my slides, I'm not gonna talk about whether we gave them the control or BRSV because it had very little effect. Just the overall fact that they were either a low PAP animal or a high PAP animal really told the story of our study. And so as we worked with these, what these calves looked like, they weighed about 700 pounds right there. Um, the calves that we used in this study, um, we had about 100 of them that we did a lot of intensive measure out of that 500 that were delivered to us. And none of these calves had it ever had any history of being treated for BRD. That doesn't mean that they, you know, hadn't had some kind of very low mild case or something, but never had any of these calves that we've used in our study um, been sick enough that somebody would need to pull them out of pen and treat them. Okay, so as we move through this, um, these calves that they were getting about 1,100 pounds, I wanted to show you that some of these calves did start to suffer from pulmonary high pulmonary hypertension and high PAP and brisket disease. And this was a steer right here. And at that time right there, he weighed about 1,100 pounds and he died shortly after that. And so we had a really nice data set of some very healthy animals and some very unhealthy animals from pulmonary hypertension to do this study. And so we actually papped these animals three times before we slaughtered them. Um, this is the first time we papped them. And um, they're in that range right here at, um, yeah, seven weight cattle and then here they're 11 weight cattle and here they're 13 weight cattle and then right here is when we slaughtered the group and what i want you to see here is that in this and about 100 steers 107 of them to be exact where we were wanting to identify high and low pap steers that as these animals got bigger and fatter their pap score the variation in pap or that bell curve started really to shift to the right and so you can see that here Okay, and then you can see it over here. So the reds, there's 1,100 pounders. By the time they got to out to about 1,300 pounders, there's a substantial number of those cattle that had really high PAPs. And of course, the average, again, was in the 50s, okay, in the high-risk category. On, on this axis right here, everywhere there's an X, a red X, that's where an animal actually died early in the feeding phase before we ever got to, you know, to slaughter these cattle. And so, yeah, our death death loss in this group of cattle was about five and a half percent, you know, due to, you know, pulmonary hypertension and those kinds of things. So here's some data um, from those cattle as we started to compare them right before they uh, either data collected right before they went to slaughter or at slaughter, because there's only way we could get a hard score was by slaughtering these animals. Our low PAP cattle in, in this study had a PAP of about 42, which is very low. And our high pap cattle were wow, 97. Body weights when we slaughtered these cattle were about the same. That's in kilos, so they're in around around 1,300 pounds. Average daily gain. This is in kilograms per day. 
uh, I apologize, I should have converted all these to, to pounds, but these were gaining about three and a half pounds a day, and these weren't making three pounds a day. So the efficiency traits were terrible. Now this is, uh, if we go at the feed to gain, this is in pounds. Our low pap animals, as we were looking at feed conversions, and these were in a feed intake unit where we could get individual feed intake data. You know, they were doing what I would call, you know, pretty decent feed to gain ratios for U.S. cattle. Um, they were converting about six pounds of feed to put on a pound of gain, but those high pappers, their conversions were terrible. Um, yeah, I was taking about 8.5 pounds of feed to put on a pound of gain, and that's a big standard error. So it, it was taking quite a bit of feed in some of those others to put on a pound of gain. And when we looked at their heart scores, yeah, most of those in the low pap group had ones, you know, very close or a one to a two, um, very normal looking heart when we slaughtered these cattle. But those high pap cattle, um, yeah, very various ranges. Um, we didn't have a, but there was lots of threes and fours, very malformed hearts and so forth. One of the other things that we did as I start to wrap up um, my talk from this and get to my conclusion slide is, is that we also, when we slaughtered these cattle, is we took a, a strip loin from each one and um, our meat science group led by Mahesh Nair, um, Chow Zai is a, a graduate student in that group. And um, they did a, a pretty intensive, just kind of what I would call a meat quality assessment from the high pappers versus the low pappers. And, a lot of that has to do with assessments that they look at whether those whether those strip loans will make it out to a nine day shelf life. And um, the high pappers would not have. Wasn't that they were five days of shelf life, but they were coming out with, you know, more, more like a eight, seven to eight day shelf life. And a lot of different things that they measured, color, redness, hue, met myoglobin, lipid oxidation were all significant between the low pappers and high pappers, even though there was really no difference in Warner Brats or shear force. So tenderness was not different between those. So as I wrap up, just to leave you with some take home messages, uh, we've been using PAP um, since the early 1980s as an indicator trait of pulmonary hypertension in cattle. And um, in general, modern day beef cattle, Angus type cattle have a a fairly high PAP relative to most other animals, especially animals at sea level. PAP is a moderately heritable trait and it's extremely polygenic. High mountain disease, um, we I didn't talk a lot about this, but typically the right side of the heart is a very obvious thing that we observe. Even though it could have been something in the lung, the heart is just a really easy phenotype to look at. When we look at feedlot cattle, that are you know up on the top of that growth curve and getting a lot of body fat on them, then we see both right and left side malformations. And again, it could have been something that went in the was going on in the lung that caused that. Um, but we observe that there is an EPD that's out there now, and our EPD does look like the bell curve. How we get that wild right side of the bell curve? Um, the EPD looks like that as well. Um, but the EPD that we're working with, and there's multiple EPD out there, the American Angus has a new EPD, American Simital is working, and their multi-breed conglomerates working on EPD. Lee Leachman, Leachman Cattle of Colorado publishes an EPD, and we help him do that. Um, that EPD looks just like that bell curve. There's a lot of animals tight around the mean, so kind of in the range of minus three to plus three. But then you get some animals with extremely high EPD, plus 19, and that's bad. You know, meaning that they're, those animals have genetic propensity to have really high PAP. And so, yeah, we know a lot about PAP and high altitude disease. Um, people at CSU have been writing papers about that for a century. Recently, though, we've been working a lot on what we call this, you know, feedlot heart disease. And um, yeah, we get some cattle that are dying, you know, kind of in that, you know, within 30 days of going to slaughter. But as more and more we learn about this, we find out that, wow, um, we see more and more cattle dying, you know, more in the early to mid phase, the diet of pulmonary hypertension as well. So that wraps up my slides and um, 
I think we'll be moving on and we'll have a, um, you know, I'll be able to answer questions as we get to the end. All right, well, thank you, Dr. Thomas. This is um, Mariah Johnson. And as um, I was introduced earlier, I'm with, with the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. But just last week, I was still with the Noble Research Institute. So in the midst of a, a job change here, and so what I want to focus on and share with you tonight is work that is ongoing at the Noble Research Institute and that I'll still continue to be involved with um, you know, as I move forward. And I have a lot of great partners in this work as well, especially Dr. Miles Sir, who's with the Veterinary Research and Consulting Services. Um, he's a lot of the brains in this. And, you know, so I want to give him that due credit. And, of course, our other great partners at the High Plains Education Research Center and the U.S. Meat Animal Research Center, as well as the Great Plains Veterinary Education Center. And so in these next few minutes, I just want to take time to, to tell you time about a new area um, that we've seen some frustrations in. And so right now we're calling that this mid-feeding period, morbidity in high-performing cattle. And I just want to touch back to Dr. Thomas's presentation, I think, you know, he really kind of has the crux of it right. You know, there's a lot that we don't know about mid to late um, feeding cattle, you know, cattle mortality or morbidity. Um, and so this is an area that we certainly don't know a lot about, um, but we're starting to try and uh, make some headway off the tip of that iceberg. So we're going to fly at about 50,000 feet here tonight, um, but just want to give you some background in this area and, and kind of start with a little bit of an introduction as we dive in. And so I think as an industry, um, you know, over the past, you know, 20, 30, 50 years, we've really made a lot of genetic selection. And in that selection, um, I would say we've selected for high performing cattle. And so I would describe high performing cattle as those that have a a high average daily gain, they have improved feed efficiency, and have really good carcass quality. However, along the way, and um, these past few years, we've started having some anecdotal observations of increased incidence of bovine respiratory disease, or BRD, and um, starting at around 45 to 100 days on feed. You know, BRD is not new. It's one of the most heavily researched areas in, in this animal science area. Um, but this later onset, um, coming at 45 to 100 days on feed, is somewhat new. And it's frustrating, right? Um, you know, when we have to treat animals later in the stage, whether it's mid or late, that results in an increased antibiotic use, just because um, those animals are, are simply bigger and heavier. When we get further down the road, we know that we've invested more in these animals at that stage of distraction. And I think the, the really frustrating part um, from a producer perspective um, is, you know, we've done this good work to, to select for good cattle with these good gains, good efficiency, and good carcass quality. But now if we're getting a morbidity issue in here, it's going to detract that feed yard from purchasing our animal. And, and you know, that's really hard to swallow when you think you when you've been doing everything right. You've been doing the things um, that researchers have advised you to do. And so we really want to, you know, fix that issue and, and dive into this. So as we think a little bit more about where we've been as an industry and just the type of cattle that we're dealing with, um, the graph on this page shows some of those historic industry carcass outcomes. And so over here on this left-hand side, on this uh, y-axis, we have carcass weight of those animals. Um, and so in our red line, we have steer weight over time and then we also in the blue um, we have the heifer weights over time and so we see these carcass weights um, increasing from the mid 90s from being in the 700s to now today we're eight and pushing 900 pounds on these carcass weights um, and so those have continued to climb throughout time and then in this black line that lines up with this um, this right hand y axis or that's showing us our percent prime and choice of cattle and so we really see the, the vast improvements especially in the past 15 years that we've made here um, in increasing that carcass quality and so the animals we're dealing with today are even perhaps a little bit different than the animals that we've dealt with in the past if we look at historic 
feedlot death loss um, roughly over the same time. And this is USDA NOMS data. We see that in 1999, our death loss was about 1.3%, you know, which is okay, right? Um, if we go down the road 12 years, 2011, so even this is a little bit dated now, we've had a 23% increase in our death loss, and death loss being around 1.6. And I can tell you that even in these past nine years or so, that number has not reversed um, and come down. And I, that's a hard number. A lot of feed yards will pencil in a 2% death loss, and, and that gets to be a hard thing to consume it, to communicate to our consumer base as well, you know, when we talk about animal welfare, we're trying to do everything right, but yet, you know, we seem to be going the wrong way on the death loss piece. Specific to BRD and in that complex, it's, a, it's complicated. Um, there's a lot of things out of our control and, you know, it's hard to identify and pin things down to one area and um, just because it's, it's a bit of a moving target. And so we sometimes think about it of it in this, this triad fashion here. You know, you have the host or that animal. Um, you know, you have the age of that animal. You know, what's the immunity or nutrition status of that animal? You also have the environment that they're a part of. What's the density of those animals in the pen? How much have they been sorted and resorted? Um, weather, pen conditions, uh, pen riders coming through, let alone just the pathogens um, that are infecting them with that primary viral infection or that secondary bacterial infection. So not an easy thing to get our arms around um, by any means. And as I mentioned, you know, there's been a lot of work in this area through time. And so when we think about morbidity um, in the feed yard, I think most of us may be familiar with the idea that typically BRD would, um, would first kind of hit the cattle when they come into the feed yard. You know, in those first 10, 20, maybe 30 days on feed, that's really where we expect to see it. Um, and I think, you know, typically we see it in, in high risk cattle as well. And so this graph here, what is really trying to communicate to us is that cumulative percent of that bovine respiratory disease um, in the feed yard um, as, as compared to the days following the feedlot arrival. And so if we follow these lines or these curves here, we really see that in these first five curves, I would say, that, um, that that BRD really onsets here in the first 30 days or so. And that's where the bulk of it happens. However, if we look out here to the seventh um, curve, seventh pattern, and we see a little bit more maybe what we're seeing today in um, this mid-feeding period where BRD is not really coming on and hitting these cattle until a little bit later. And so, this this chart and um, this data from Babcock back in 2010, only 5% of the lots fell into uh, this pattern seven here. So if you ask Mariah, you know, so what kind of cattle are you seeing this in? And, and I'll tell you right now, this is anecdotal information. And we're working really hard to get our arms around this and to put some data together so we can have some better definitions and we can more concretely say, yes, it's these sorts of cattle or not. Um, you know, and those research projects are getting started, but that's not where we're at. And so the things I'll, I'll lay out to you here, um, you know, they're, they're not gospel, but they're, they're what we've been seeing. And so the type of cattle that we've seen some of these issues in, I would say are mostly Bosporus, you know, English or English continental cross type cattle. They're spring born, they're fall weaned, and they've been preconditioned 60 days or more, and really have some good herd health. And these cattle are coming from producers who are, who are doing the right thing, and who are progressive. You know, they've had their black leg shots, they've had their viral respiratory and shipping fever, they've been dehorned, castrated, and warmed. And I think I think these are animals that we would have traditionally said are, are quote, bulletproof, you know, when we think about them going to the feed yard. Um, but now we're starting to see some chinks in the armor of these, of these bulletproof cattle, you know, so maybe they're not as bulletproof as we thought. But again, I think that's really frustrating because, you know, it's not in, on cattle um, that we would consider high risk or where you might expect this kind of issue, but really coming from the places that are doing the right thing. 
in, in those frustrations per, persist at the feed jar level as well. Um, we've seen a really rapid progression um, at the onset of this midday morbidity. And so for the pin riders or the vets or whoever may be that go out and look at the calves, they'll go through them in the morning and they'll look good. They'll look just fine. And then they come back through in the afternoon and that animal is barely hanging on to life or is already dead which I think, you know, begins to take a mental toll about, you know, what am I missing when I'm looking at these cattle? How did I not see this? Um, you know, and, and can cause some blame to be passed around as well. So really, you know, create the disheartening situation. However, we have seen for those that do get caught, um, you know, before they're dead, that they do respond to antibiotic treatment. And so that's really positive is, is that if we can catch this, you know, we can get them treated and really help them out and, you know, we can get them past this. We do know that when we, when we treat them though, that they're at this increased body weight just because they're later in the feeding period and it, antibiotics are not cheap. There's no way around it. So it's costly to administer. We're giving more to them because of their increased body weight. Um, and, uh, you know, in this industry, we talk a lot too about being judicious in our use of antibiotics, but those pressures still continue to come from consumers and shareholders of companies about reducing antibiotic use or reducing um, human the use of human important antibiotics especially and you know and how many places do we go all the time where we see things that say never ever antibiotics and that pressure is not going to let up and um, you know and so because of that we really feel very strongly that we're going to have to figure out what's what's the driver of this issue we can't just continue to treat this with a needle but we've really got to get to the root of this problem so one of the things that we did um, last fall as we started to work through and get into this issue was we brought in a convening event of industry personnel so um, feed yard managers cow calf producers nutritionists geneticists and um, vets you know, kind of a whole gamut of people to get a good representation of people um, that had seen this issue, worked with this issue, and really to all come to the table and say, what do we know? Let's put this on the, on the table because we've got to start somewhere. And so we came out of that meeting with what I have listed on this page is some of these working definitions because, again, this is a totally new area. And so we've, we've got to, you know, do these simple things like, make the definition so we're all talking the same language and so we came out of there and um, defined high performing cattle um, as top 25 percent of cattle fed based upon their high average daily gains and their low feed conversions and that these are also cattle with those high quality carcasses so um, 90 percent prime and choice are better additionally we, you know we talked about difficult in the stage that we're at to assess if this increased morbidity and mortality is among this population only. You know, we're gonna to need to get some more data, which again, we're starting to do and those studies are starting. But those anecdotal observations are of increased incidence of BRD at 45 to 100 days on feed. And that's also how we ended up with this mid feeding period BRD working definition. And so in saying that it's any first treatment for BRD occurring after 45 days on feed. And so now as we, we move forward in these next few slides, I just want to show you some of the anecdotal data that we've been able to put together around this issue, you know, because I think we can ask the question, like, are you sure of what you're seeing? Is this not just a one-off case? Is this not um, one feed yard or from a group of producers in one location? And I, and I want to emphasize that it's not. At first, we probably thought that it was, and I think that's how a lot of people felt, and we didn't really want to talk about this issue or admit that we had this issue, um, you know, but in that role at Noble, was really, really fortunate to not only get to work with um, cow-calf producers and stalker producers, but also the feed yards, and to be a little bit of that trusted voice, and so with our relationships, you know, we were able to ask people, you know, hey, have, have you had this sort of issue or seen anything like that, and the more we talked to people, the more it came out of the woodworth of, of yeah we've we've been seeing this issue and so um, we're really fortunate to be able to pull together you know several different data points to, to really confirm what we were seeing so this chart here um, shows us that cumulative brd first treatment rate in those high performing cattle and so again down here at the bottom we have the numbers of days on feed 
and on our y-axis here, that cumulative BRD first treatment rate. And so as we, as we follow this black line here, and the shading shows us our confidence interval around that, um, you know, yeah, we see BRD kind of in its first 20, 30 days, but then we really see it increase from this 40 days out onto 100 days. Um, and so for that, for us, that really kind of, you know, led to some of the suspicion and helped to confirm that. And this data was on 2,400 calves back in 2017-18 that ended up having a death loss that was near 2.5%. So not great, not where we want it to be. So a little bit now on kind of this repeatability, some of the other data that we looked at um, around this. Um, so this was a, not as many heads. So this was on 200 um, commercial heifers. And so again, days on feed down here at the bottom. So this is days on feed at their first treatment for BRD. And so we see kind of that expected, yeah, we had some cow treated in the first 20, 30 days, but yeah, here we are. We're looking and seeing this second wave of calves and um, being treated for BRD, you know, at 40, 60, 80, on out to 100 days on feed. And on those calves, um, we were able to tie that data back to the ranch level. And I think that's really important because I think to solve this issue, we're really going to have to work together as a supply chain um, about what's going on at the ranch level, what's going on at the feeding level, um, and, and work together to, to find the, a solution to this, to find some of these answers. And so these calves all came um, from some herds that were managed very similarly, had um, similar genetic makeup, breed composition, um, had very similar management styles, herd health protocols, you know, and these were the producers that, again, I would say were doing the right things, preconditioning their calves. But even in this, you know, there's some smaller numbers and we have some ranches that sent not very many head. Um, but we, the takeaway here being that we really saw results kind of all over the board. You know, so we had some that had some higher BRD first pull rates. Um, those calves got treated, no deaths, no issues. Um, whereas some had, you know, a little bit higher bed rates. And, and so I think it's going to take a lot more just digging in because even when we looked at this data, it wasn't like we could pull one fact and say, aha, it's because of this one thing that's happening at the ranch level. That certainly wasn't there. And so last piece on the repeatability, the data we were looking at, the chart on the left um, was for 63 steers. And so we had some in that lot, gal yeah, got sick at 30 days, but then we had some who didn't get pulled for BRD for the very first time. And so all the way out at 166 days. So right before they're ready to go to harvest. This chart over here on the right was for a larger group. So over 2,200 steers and heifers over a two year time period. And so again, yeah, we see that wave in the beginning uh, of cattle in that early phase getting BRD, but then we definitely see a lot of them and still getting BRD for the very first time at 40, 50, 60, on out to 100 days on feed. And over these two years had um, mortality well over 2%, which again, disappointing, frustrating, especially when it's coming from cattle that you would consider to be bulletproof or you know doing all the right things. So as we really um, you know, were able to kind of firm up um, what we were seeing, um, we were able to put together a research objective, and at about that same time, uh, the International Consortium for Antimicrobial Stewardship in Animals was just forming. And so this is a consortium um, out of FAR, or the Foundation for Food and Ag Research. And so FAR was formed out of the 2014 Farm Bill, um, and will give grant money. So this is your tax dollars, um, hard at work, on an issue that we're seeing here in the beef industry. And so, um, you know, this group collectively came together, joined ACASA, and was able to get some grant funding from them to go and see if we could identify what some of these potential causes are of BRD and high-performing cattle. And, you know, subsequently, what we're really trying to get to is developing those appropriate management strategies so we can reduce antibiotic use. So I'd say we had a little bit of a shotgun approach here because, again, remember, this is a really, really new area. And, you know, we don't even know what we don't know at this point. And so we just wanted to take this tactic and see, you know, let's try some different areas and see what we figure out and bring that back. 
And so as I already mentioned a little bit, the second bullet point last fall, we had that convening event with industry personnel. We're going to follow up with another one um, later this year and, and keep circling back on that. And that's been really helpful and productive. Additionally, where I'll talk a little bit more about tonight um, was kind of the first pass at this evaluating the rate of gain and the length of backgrounding. Um, and so this is preliminary. We're working on getting some of this stuff published. And so again, that's where I'll focus. I want you to know um, that we are evaluating the genetics, feed intake, physiological response. We're doing a retrospective analysis of previous vaccination status, as well as evaluating that virus and bacteria prevalence. Um, although we won't necessarily dig into all of that tonight. And so just to set up this rate of gain and length of backgrounding, I'd say our, our hypothesis, you know, our kind of our thought process going into this was if we take these cattle, they've all been managed the same on the ranch, we precondition them for 60 days, and then um, we split the group at that point. And half of those um, cattle went on up to the feed yard. And so the idea there is that those cattle that come straight out of a preconditioning program and go to the feed yard. Maybe, maybe are they not quite ready? Is, are they not as physiological, um, you know, mature? And so they're the ones that perhaps struggle with BRD a little bit more and are seeing this midday morbidity, as opposed to um, in another group, which we kicked out on small grain pasture who grazed there um, through graze out at mid April, you know, so really for another four or five months. Are those cattle better prepared because they've grown at a slower growth rate um, and, and able to handle those BRD challenges a little bit better? And as science would have it, you know, it tells you what you don't know. And, you know, and, and the results were not, they weren't what we had hypothesized at all. And so in this chart, again, we have that cumulative morbidity over here on our y-axis, the left-hand side, and our days on feed down here at the bottom. And so this orange line would represent the background of cattle or the cattle that went to the feed yard straight out of the preconditioning um, program. The blue line here representing those cattle that went onto small grains pasture or through graze out and uh, through mid-April. And so really what these lines are telling us is here is that you know, the morbidity rate, you know, hit quicker and was also much higher um, for this cow that went from graze out as opposed to those that went straight after preconditioning. So a little bit of a head scratcher there, something that, you know, just completely blew apart what we thought maybe we knew. Um, but when we put that data from both of these groups together, um, we did find one, one interesting thing, I'd say kind of the one nugget that we hung on to, is we looked at what is that average daily gain rate of these animals during their first 30 days on feed? And so that gives us this chart here below. So all of those animals that remained healthy, you can see are depicted by these blue bars. The animals that um, fell ill to BRD are represented by kind of this coral or orange colored bar down here at the bottom. And you can see some overlap between these BRD and healthy animals. And so the interesting thing here being um, that those animals that did not gain nearly as well during those first 30, on, 30 days on feed were the ones that were afflicted with BRD. You know, and that can make sense too, because perhaps um, these animals are not necessarily eating enough um, to support their immune function. And so this was an interesting find for us, certainly not an answer. And as I mentioned, you know, just in general and all that we're working on, we're really at the tip of the iceberg on this. And um, there's a lot of great studies that are getting started. You know, there are several of the biggest feeders in the U.S. that are stepping up to the plate and willing to contribute some data around this and have that analyzed. And so um, we have some better answers. But that's, that's where we're at in this process tonight. And so it's just something that I wanted to bring forward and to, to everyone out there so you could be aware of it in case you do hear, you know, of this out in the industry. And so with that, I know we're going to take questions at the end, but I'm always happy to talk whether it's tonight or any other time to anyone about this, um, as I'm sure Dr. Miles Sir would as well. And um, like I said, he's, he's pretty integral. He's the brains in this project. And so, um, and just thank you to all of our um, collaborators and the people who make this possible, whether that's through our cost of funding um, or the folks at High Plains, Great Plains Veterinary Education Center, as well as those at USDA Mark. So, 
that's what I've got for you right now. I'm going to pass it off to our last presenter of the evening, that's Dr. Dan Thompson. I assume you can see my screen. Hello there, I'm Dr. Dan Thompson, uh, formerly of Kansas State University uh, and now at Iowa State University. And I'm gonna try to keep mine to about 10 to 15 minutes here so we can get wrapped up. But, uh, you know, fatigue cattle syndrome and other things that we've seen at the end of the feeding period, uh, I wanna make sure, what the heck? Not advancing my slide. There it is. You know, one of the things we want to make sure of is that we uh, spend a lot of time feeding our cattle, and the last thing we want to do is is do something at the end of the cattle feeding period that that uh, we can erase two years of work in five minutes. These are some Wagyu cattle, um, and and these cattle can be on feed for 700 or or longer time periods, 700 days or longer, and so. Um, these are the ones that you, when you drive by, you just kind of hold your breath and say, keep going. But they look like mammoths when they go out. And, and uh, I just drive this home as something that we spend a lot of time every day talking about proper cattle handling, talk about uh, making sure we mix feed correctly, that we ride pins in a, in a great manner, that we doctor cattle, that we take care of them. And then that last five minutes when we take them and get them out of the home pen, move them to the to the loadout to send them to the packer can be crucial to making money or not making money. Two things we're going to talk about are bruises and fatigue cattle syndrome. And, and I won't belabor this, but whether you're talking about cattle in the U.S., cattle in Colombia, cattle in the U.K., bruising on cattle as they go from the feedlot to the packing plant is an issue. We estimate that we will lose around five to ten dollars per head per on bruising uh, when we have this at the plants. And we spent a lot of time over the last five years, my graduate students and I, uh, in packing plants and my uh, uh, veterinary partners from the production animal consultation. Um, we spend a lot of time uh, looking at this. We looked at eight over eight thousand uh, carcasses to look at the bruising and these pictures are the typical bruising that we will see at, at uh, slaughter. And what we found was that 53% of cattle had at least one bruise. And the place that we saw the highest prevalence of the bruises was down the midline. So somewhere along the chain, along the supply chain or along the transport chain, these cattle were getting bruised on their, their uh, dorsal midline which was an expensive place to have a wizard knife go and, and take the bruise out. And what we found was, for the most part, was cattle were getting bruised on their way down into the belly of trucks or coming up out of the belly of the trucks. And, and one thing I will caution, that the faster the cattle go in, when we have these steep steps and those cattle are going, um, as you've ever seen a calf come up to a pond bank or to a creek bank, when they get to a place that's steep, they get to the bottom, they jump. And when they jump, their rear end comes up and they catch themselves here where we used to hold the ramps uh, for cattle going onto the top deck. So some of the adjustments that we made or some of the things we have to be aware of to prevent bruising, one is make sure you have a fat cattle trailer, which has three more inches of clearance in the bottom. Um, also, decrease the speed of the cattle going onto the truck. The faster they go on the truck, the more chance there is that they're going to jump off of that those steps into the, the bottom deck. Um, the other thing, the adjustments that have been made, one, we and for $2,500, you can take your current Merritt or Wilson trailer in and have these adjustments made to provide more room for cattle and prevent bruising. They will slide the back of the top deck forward about a foot, which gives you a lot more clearance of cattle going down into the belly. They have extended the steps into the belly so that the, the cattle go down at a slower grade. And the last thing is, instead of having that, that uh, ramp go up underneath the, the, the top deck, the bottom of the top deck, they now put it on a hinge where it just opens to the side and you can latch it to the, to the side of the truck, creating a lot more space decreasing bruising. 
we saw prevalence when we made the corrections in the trailers go from 50 percent bruising rate in cattle at slaughter to five percent so it makes a significant difference the other thing i want to talk to you about is the description of fatigue cattle syndrome we have seen fatigue pig syndrome in in cattle or in pigs for for many years we also now are seeing this in cattle so what do we see when we see this is usually an overfinished cattle and with this this decrease in packer uh, capacity today and more cattle being held and cattle that are going to be bigger in the summer i have a lot of um worry about things that we're going to see such as atypical interstitial pneumonia uh, and fatigue cattle syndrome as we come into this summer but cattle will not show any signs at the the feedlot but then we will have these problems where they have trouble breathing they have lameness muscle tremors but they are what we call slow movers and slow movers are animals that are locked up if you've ever had a horse that suffered from rhabdomyolysis or monday morning sickness or if you played a sport and the day after your first uh, practice, you feel kind of good and then you sit down and, and then you go to get back up and you're stiff and you're sore, that's from that lactic acid buildup in the muscles. And we'll talk a little bit about why that happens. We use blood lactate today to measure athletic performance. Uh, you can see this young lady on the bicycle. They will look and match the heart rate to lactate accumulation in the blood. And as we have accumulation of lactate, it inhibits the muscle's ability to contract. And the athlete has to stop or slow down. This is an athlete in this picture. This calf is not. And I thought Dr. Thomas did a great job of describing the obesity and, and, and this. Can you imagine if, um, if you uh, were sitting in your, you know, first of all, we put these cattle up in a hotel room. We feed them a, a calorically dense diet, all you can eat brought fresh two, three times a day. We have someone that goes through the pen checking on them and asking if they're okay. And then on the day that we're gonna ship them, we go in at four in the morning and we flip on the lights. And now we're gonna move these animals at too rapid of a rate or, or stir them up. And, and we've timed how fast cattle move when they go from the pen down our drover's alleys to the loadouts. And it's usually around a six to seven minute mile even at, a, at a, what we would consider a trot. And, and I would reckon you to go out after 120, 180 days in a hotel with room service, uh, all you can eat, go out and try to run a six minute mile. Here are some of the numbers that we see, and I just wanna show you what normal uh, is and what we saw when we saw these, these cattle that are having adverse effects at the packing plant that can't move. These animals, when they come off the truck, they're so stiff and sore, they're alert, they can look around, but they literally can't move. I mean, they're taking little short baby steps um, and, and they'll just get to a spot and they'll just stop. And then when we press on them more, they'll go down. And once they go down, um, it's very rarely that they get up. But the green section here is cattle that were uh, at the feedlot that we took. So the normal lactate levels, two to three uh, millimolars per liter, whether they were on zilpaterol or actopamine, those were normal uh, lactate levels. Likewise, there's our normal CK levels. CK is creatine kinase. And when we have muscle tissue damage, we see increases in CK. The yellow bars are cattle that we followed to slaughter. And these were animals that were moving normally uh, so that we could see what their lactate levels or CK levels. And you can see that we do have increases in lactate and CK levels, but these animals were clinically normal and were able to move no problem. This was just increased lactate from coming out of the home pen, going up the loadout chute, being on the truck, and then going to Larridge. But when we have the adverse effects, you can see that we have these uh, lactate levels of 30, so, so 15 times normal. And we have these, these CK levels of six to 7,000 international units per liter. And, and in the swine industry, this is exactly what we saw. Normal hogs that moved normally through, through slaughter had 11 millimolars of lactate, but cat, the pigs that went down or were slow movers, 30 millimolars of lactate. 
CK, I said, is, is associated with rhabdomyolysis. Uh, normal childbirth causes a six-fold elevation in CK levels. And when we see these animals uh, at the plant uh, with, that are slow movers or, or fatigued cattle, we will see uh, you know, 30 times the normal levels. So we did some studies, and I'll just go through this pretty quick. We took two groups of cattle, well, actually four groups. We had cattle that we went to, to measure the amount of finish on them. So we had cattle that had less amount of finish and cattle that were further finished, so cattle with more back fat. And we put them through one of two uh, uh, strategies of where we moved these animals for a mile. And, and we brought them in at a half mile or we brought them in at a, at a mile and we took blood samples. And our goal was to see these animals were not fed a beta agonist. So our goal was, can we cause fatigue cattle syndrome with or without beta agonist in the, the feed? So, so we took these animals, we stratified them. They were assigned to one of two treatments. They were either aggressively handled where they were kept at a trot or low stress where they were kept at a walk. We put a lead rider in front of them. The animals went around this, this course four laps. We brought them in and we bled them at a half mile, a mile, and then rest. And I know a half mile or a mile sounds like a long ways, but when you look at where some of our loadouts are and where we move cattle across feed yards, it's, it's not that, that uh, far of a stretch. So this is slow st low stress cattle handling. You can see as we walked them, um, this is about an 18 minute mile. So it takes some patience to move cattle this slowly. Um, but if you remember on the Chisholm Trail, they didn't run them uh, north. This is the high stress handling. And I was really nervous that we were moving these cattle too fast as they came as a trot. But uh, one of the places we were doing research, they were shipping that day and they actually passed us um, uh, our treatment cattle. So I think we got it about right. The green bar represent the cattle that were run, the black bar represent the cattle that were walked. And you can see here that, that at 800 meters and 1600 meters, we had an increase in heart rates, but we did not have increase in respiration rates. And some of the thing that we have to start thinking about with respiration, so cattle in the predator-prey relationship, what they will do instead of breathing faster, they have the physiology where they will breathe deeper so that they don't look like they're stressed or out of breath. So cattle will actually breathe deeper. And I think that's part of our reason for some of our BRD issues as we move forward. But that was something that was pretty cool physiologically. Here's cortisol levels. You can see we had significant increases in cortisol in the animals that were run versus the one with the lead rider. And then when we look at blood lactate, you can see that the green bar, the cattle that were run, had significantly higher lactate levels but what was amazing to me, cattle that were walked a half mile or a mile, their lactate levels didn't move at all. So they were not stressed, they were not fatigued. Um, these animals were, were in, in good shape. One of the things we also learned about creatine kinase is that this is more of a delayed response than a rapid response. And the bigger differences we saw was the further time away from the, the time in which those animals were aggressively handled versus low stress handling. When we looked at, and, and I just wanna draw your attention to thin versus fat, fat on lactate levels post handling. When we come over here and we look at thin cattle, their response was, to, was not as big in animal handling and aggressive handling as the more finished cattle. So, so, Cattle that are aggressively handled have higher lactate. We can create fatigue cattle syndrome in cattle not on a beta agonist, regardless of their finish. But the more the cattle are finished, or the heavier they are at the time, or more back fat, the bigger the response in lactate is um, to aggressive handling, which makes sense, which also makes us nervous about what's coming this summer. As far as post handling at the plant, um, you could see we had more muscle tremors in the ones that were aggressively handled than the ones that were walked. So at the end of the day, fatigue cattle syndrome, I can tell you are three biggest risk factors. Overfinished cattle handled aggressively during heat, heat of the summer. We can't control the heat stress. We can't control uh, probably the finish based on packing capacity. 
but we can um, address how we handle those cattle. Uh, how far are you gonna move them from the loadout? What time of day are you shipping? Afternoon versus morning? Um, you know, and then some of the other things that, that could be a big one is gathering those cattle out of the home pen. We can't run them around and run them around and run them around that home pen. Uh, we can't just let them go and let them move across the yard at will. We have to help lead them, use good cattle handling, help lead them out of the pen, and we have to have a lead rider in front of those animals um, as we move them across the, the yard. We are seeing some people that are going in and acclimating those cattle uh, or exercising those cattle to learn how to move out of the pen and move back into the pen uh, at the beginning of the feeding period. That's paying off dividends for when we ship. Also, we see people that are staging finished cattle and pinning them closer to the loadout facilities. And the last thing I'll touch on is, is one of our big things we have to address as we move forward is that we have to decrease the amount of time that cattle wait on the truck at packing plants, um, especially this summer and especially as big as these cattle are. Um, this is something that, that uh, I think is something that's gonna, that we need to draw attention to as cattle feeders and packers, and we need to work on our logistics Whenever we get to these plants, USDA or you know the plant will say we're waiting on anamortem from USDA, or or they'll say USDA will say we don't have enough pins to to hold all the cattle for anamortem. Whatever it is, it's it's coordination um, of these cattle as they're arriving at the plant and some of the things that because when one of these animals goes down or one of these animals is is tied up, they may let that animal sit for an hour and and recuperate. But if that animal isn't recovering, that animal is going to get rendered and it's going to get tanked. And that's a big loss for the, the cattle feeder. Um, one thing I will also say um, as you, as you uh, move out on this is remember that as these cattle get bigger, our alleys, our, our slants for holding cattle and where we're working cattle didn't get bigger. And as we have an increase in volume, I spend a lot of time behind plants working on cattle handling. And as we've gone from 1,200 to 1,500 and 1,600 pound cattle, those cattle fill that alley up and, and putting a, a load of cattle or a pin of cattle in that, that same type of alley, there's a lot less volume uh, or a lot more volume of cattle and less volume of alley. And so injuries and things like that are, are uh, something I want everybody to look out for. Um, with that, I'm going to pass this over to uh, Gary Porter. I want to thank you for your attention. Here's my new email address, same cell phone. Uh, let me know if I can help you. All right. Thank you to all our presenters for tonight's presentation. Hello, my name is Gary Porter. I'm a corn grower and a cattleman from Missouri and proudly sit on the NCGA corn board. The partnership between NCGA and NCBA is about bringing the latest relevant information to producers in the industry. And each of our presenters has certainly helped us achieve that goal tonight. As we move into our questions and answers session, please remember to type your questions into the question chat box. Now let's get to your questions. Thank you again for participating in tonight's webinar and I'll hand it over to Jesse Fulton Director and Producer of Education with NCBA to moderate tonight's Q&A. Thank you, Gary. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As a reminder, uh, go ahead and chat in your questions over at the side box. Uh, see that we've already had a couple questions come in. Um, Dr. Thomas, looks like the first question is coming to you. Um, do growth prom promotants affect PAP? Well, let's, let's break growth promotants down in whether we're talking about beta agonist or um, steroidogenic promotants. What, what little we know about that, the steroidogenic promotants in some research that one of our former graduate students, Joe Neary, did, the, the steroidogenic promotants actually looked like they had some type of protective effect of, against IPAP. They actually helped the animal deal with it better. Um, and I would say what little data we have about beta agonists, it says the opposite. Those effects were very minimal, not huge. 
but yeah, one negative, one positive. I would like to say as I listen to Dan talk about um, all the lactate information, lactate's usually a very good indicator if an animal's been suffering from pulmonary hypertension as well. All right. Um, just gonna jump over to Myra's uh, a question for you. Um, when you were doing your research, uh, I believe you talked about some of these cattle being at Noble. You know, was it more just those cattle, or do you think this happened across feed yards across the nation? You know, Jesse, uh, that's a good question of whether it was just cattle that we were seeing coming from Noble, those producers we work with, or really um, across the nation. And I'll say, you know, in the beginning, that's probably something we probably feared, right, is that this was an issue related to the people we we're working with and had we led them astray or, you know, caused this in any sort of way. Um, but really, as we got to talking to a bunch of the different feed yards, they were able to confirm for us that, no, this this isn't a problem we're seeing just on cattle from, from you know, the noble ranches specifically or folks that work with us. You know, they're saying, you know, we're seeing it from across the nation. We're seeing it from um, different states up and down the Great Plains. And so it's so not just those cattle, um, you know, and I feel like we've got enough data now to really to believe that and to know that to be accurate. Excellent. Uh, Dr. Thompson, <clears throat> do you anticipate seeing a higher rate of cattle with fatigue cattle syndrome due to uh, a lot of our fat cattle and during this time during, you know, uh, a lot of cattle being held up at the feed yard because plants are slowing down. Are you anticipating we see a lot of fatigue cow syndrome or do you think we're going to be able to slow those cattle down and, and back them off their rations a little bit um, to try to prevent it? It's a good question. I don't think we'll back them off because look at the end of the feeding period. I think we'll back them off from the beginning. But I think that what we'll see, you know, with carcass transfer, we really can't uh, slow them down at the end. I, I, I would, I would anticipate we may uh, see more fatigue cattle syndrome this summer if we don't try to prevent it uh, when we ship fats, because if we have cattle that are bigger and more, more finished, um, and it, depending on the weather we have this summer, um, I think those two will be uh, known entities. And then in our research that we have done with different packers uh, throughout the years, and we've looked at one study with 60,000 head on fatigue cattle syndrome. It is a feedlot by feedlot phenomenon, not a weather or cattle type phenomenon. We can predict, the, the packers know which feed yards have uh, consistently have fatigue cattle syndrome, and it goes back to how you uh, move those cattle out of the home pen and how you get them to the loadout. All right, uh, Dr. Thomas, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, I actually got a couple questions for you. Uh, the first one, um, I think you touched on a little bit some of the visual signs of PAP, but can you just re reiterate those again? Just some of the visual uh, signs a producer can be looking for and then how uh, how they commonly diagnose it. Yeah, if an animal's pretty in an advanced stage, the swollen brisket is pretty obvious. If you ever see that, you'll never forget it. Um, and if you do a post-mortem necropsy, the, um, of course, the malformed heart is, is very obvious, that right side of it. But another, another really strong indicator in, in, the, um, in, in a necropsy is what we call the nutmeg liver. Not only does the liver get that odd nutmeg color, it will actually start to look more like a sponge instead of uh, having those nice, um, you know, sharp edges to each lobe of the liver. That's that's another really interesting thing. But in, in live cattle, it, it's quite a challenge. Um, sometimes, and if you go to that paper that I talked about, if anybody can find that paper by Greta Crafter. Um, she's got some really good pictures in there. So sometimes you can actually see the jugular vein um, be very distended because of the pressure, you know, coming back from the from the pulmonary artery back towards the jugular. 
sometimes you can see that and sometimes it's just kind of hard to see and I, I would say really a, a pin rider that's seen a lot of it will catch it the the cattle will stand and they'll stand with their elbows kind of pointing out that's because you know they're they're feeling pressure within the uh, thoracic cavity and cardiopulmonary system and so they stand a little awkward uh, but that's that's really a challenge. Is sometimes so how do you see that in a live animal? All right. And uh, do you have an idea of how current PAP EDs relate to actual PAP scores? Yeah, we actually um, in the Lee Leachman data set, we've actually done that. It's it's pretty well. Um, it we will follow that. Those PAP EPDs will look like that odd bell-shaped curve where there's a lot of animals, a lot of animals that are real close to the mean, just plus minus, and then you get those real high um, PAP EPD animals. But again, I just want to say that our PAP EPD that's being published right now was designed, you know, to deal with the altitude issue. We don't really have a good data set yet. We're working on getting that to say, what does the PAP EPD mean to the PAP in the feedlot? Because you know, they're just kind of different animals. If you're looking at, at PAP in a yearling bull, even though we might have a marbling score for that bull from ultrasound, that's still, a yearling bull is a pretty lean creature. But comparing that to an animal at the top of that growth curve, particularly as we're talking about these cattle that are headed this summer, you know, 15, 1600 pound steer, that's extremely fat. Those are, those are kind of different, those are very different animals. And that's that's something that we're working to get because that's a really needed piece of information. What does PAP EPD for altitude? How correlated is that with PAP with PAP in the, in the uh, feedlot cattle? All right, uh, Dr. Thompson, um, with the fatigue cattle syndrome, or what do you think about if we were providing shade uh, and wetting cattle down before we ship them? Um, do you think that's going to cause more of a problem? Uh, will that water on them cause them to retain heat in their body, or do you think it would cool them down before we put them on a trailer and ship them? Uh, I, th I think if there's anything, I mean, uh, shade is the, the thing that would probably help the most. Um, you know, I I think that if if we're looking at strategic shade in feed yards, it's it's you know our cattle at the the end of the feeding period, and then uh, shade over our loadouts where we let cattle sit until people uh, come and and load them for us. I also think that that if we're going to put shade in feed yards, one of the biggest mistakes I see in the summertime is that we put shades in that are square or that are too small, and all the cattle congregate underneath them. And we wind up with too many cattle underneath there, and they urinate there all day, and we get a you know get a a, a bog, and those and we wind up with a big foot rock wreck. So so I caution this that if you're going to do it, put shade in such that shade will move as the sun moves during the day, so that the cattle move and we urinate uh, in different places, or at least the cattle urinate in different places, and and uh, uh, we don't get those those wet holes and and then the cattle getting foot rot all right uh dr johnson um coming back over to your topic uh do you see that a lot more issues um with what your topic was covering uh for particular breeds um you know english versus english continental or straight continental sure that's a that's a really good question it's a tough question um you know, when we brought people in for the convening event and we just kind of laid out this idea of what do you know about this? You know, a lot of people were pretty quick to jump to, you know, it's English or English continental crosses. Um, but I would say that's absolutely not conclusive, you know, because at this point we're at that, that early stage. We certainly do not have enough data um, to, to say that, you know, and so a great deal more work really needs to be done in this area you know, working with breed associations and ge geneticists to make, you know, some accurate determinations. And we're working with those folks and going to bring more in in the future on this. Um, and, you know, another thing I would, I would put in there, I mentioned that, you know, there's going to be some more research going forward and that some different feed yards are going to be willing to contribute on. And that's going to be funded through 
ICASA, but really compiling that massive amount of data. And that's going to allow us to better define the issue. You know, is it more prevalent in some of these breeds or not? But I really just think it's far too early for us to say that right now. All right. Uh, Dr. Thompson got a question um, about preconditioning. Uh, is it as important as PAP scores? And, and what are the good, better, best things a cow-calf producer might consider uh, when marketing preconditioned calves to the feedlot um, and relating that to the PAP scoring? I think they said Thompson, but I think they meant Thomas. Yeah, Thomas, I'm sorry, Dr. Thomas, sorry. Okay, ask it again, because I thought Dan Thompson was getting the question. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't do it until he said tap, and then I was like, uh-uh-uh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, just talking about preconditioning, getting cattle ready to go to the to the feedlot, and, you know, the importance of PAP scores. So, you know, is there a good, better, best things for the cow-calf producer needs to consider when they're about to market those animals um, as it relates to the PAP scoring? Yeah, PAP, PAP scoring has, you know, worked well for the seed stock industry because even though we say we did 10,000 animals, you know, in the in the mountainous western region of the U.S. in a year, that's still a pretty small number. PAP scoring is, it's just really not practical to do that on, you know, it's more of a, when we start talking about fed cattle, it's just something we use as a research tool, you know, I um, mean, because a big, a big day of PAP testing is 100 animals. And um, so in, in general, I, I would say that, you know, what is yet to come are better tools to know who, what might be an animal that's going to suffer from pulmonary hypertension and so forth. But the one thing we can work on today is no doubt, whether it's anecdotal or not, comorbidity is an issue. Um, and, you know, even as we go through the coronavirus thing, there's probably not a day goes by that I don't hear something about comorbidity. And so the healthier we can get those cattle to go into the feed yard, you know, the more likely this is this trip is going to go well. I thought Dr. Johnson presented some, you know, a lot of data about our struggles, but I still think that that's still number one is do, do the best we can to keep get them healthy to going in preconditioned cattle and get them started and you know we'll do our best to figure, find better tools and make better tools to keep them healthy as we go all the way through all right perfect um it looks like we're running out of time here um and we're going to have to conclude our session for tonight i know there are some questions still coming in uh we do have your email and we will make sure these questions get to our speakers um so that they can respond to you um i'd like to thank you all again for for joining us tonight um, and I'd like to invite you uh, to our next webinar series, uh, Mineral Supplementation Series, which is going to be coming this summer. We have a four-part series lined up um, with some great speakers. So keep an eye out on, at ncba.org under the producer tabs uh, for those dates. I'd like to thank our speakers for getting on, Dr. Dan Thompson, Dr. Milt Thomas, and Dr. Mariah Johnson. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening.